So, so good morning everyone and uh, good morning also to um, uh, a number of uh, participants who are um, uh, uh, view viewing this session by webcast. So, so welcome to, to you across the state. Um, uh, it, today's session is being webcast and it's also being recorded and so there will be an opportunity to, uh, uh, to view that uh, later through the, the link that's been provided. Uh, my, my name is Peter Lacey. I'm Acting Executive Director for the Office of the Chief Advisor Procurement. Uh, with me is Sharon Bailey, who is the Chief Advisor Procurement. Um, and we're here to talk to you today about um, uh, uh, two new government initiatives, the Ethical Supplier Mandate and Ethical Supplier Threshold. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, for those who are viewing the session uh, online, um, uh, please be aware that you, there is a speech bubble in your, um, uh, in your, on your screen. That's the ask button. Uh, so if you are online and you wish to pose a question, uh, that's, that's the vehicle for you to do that. If you can uh, click that and click send, uh, we'll get that question and we will put that question uh, to the group here when we come to that part of the presentation. Um, I, I would ask you, we do have a brief presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. If you can hold your questions till the end of the presentation, that would be great. So uh, I think without further ado, I might introduce Sharon uh, and, um, and, and welcome her to the presentation. Thanks. Peter and welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along today. I know there's been a range of information out there and you may already have seen some of this. The idea today is to be quite interactive. The presentation will really just focus, I've just set the parameters of that, give you some broader information, which as I said you may already have, uh, and allow us then to have a bit of an interactive session with questions. And as Peter said, we'll take questions from the audience, but also questions um, from those people who are viewing this through the live stream. So thank you. Now I'll just make sure that I can work the technology, which is always the tricky part. Terrific. So uh, this morning we're here to talk about um, the ethical supply mandate and the ethical supply threshold. Uh, they are two parts of the Buy Queensland approach, the most recent two parts of the Buy Queensland approach. Uh, and it's being presented uh, from Housing and Public Works and the Office of the Chief Advisor because we look after the Queensland Procurement Policy Compliance Unit, which will have responsibility for the identification of breaches under these new initiatives. Now, when this was being consulted and developed, it was also called the Supplier Demerit Scheme, so you might know it from that incarnation. Uh, but I think the intention is really to look at this from the, the positive side and, and set that expectation that the Queensland Government is only interested in doing business with ethical suppliers. Uh, you all know better than I do the risk of procuring from people who aren't ethical, uh, who don't meet their commitments and the risk that brings to the Queensland Government and, and our customers. So this is uh, the final part of the Buy Queensland approach, which really is about the sanctions that exist for not complying with uh, what, what's been set out. So what is the ethical supplier mandate? Uh, the mandate, as I said, is all about ensuring that only responsible suppliers contract with the Queensland Government. Uh, it has been, uh, being, it is being uh, introduced in a phased manner. So it began on the 1st of August with the building um, construction and maintenance category of spend uh, and it will, uh, we will continue to look at it and review it and then come 1 October it will apply to the transport and infrastructure category. Uh, we will then have a review in uh, early next year to go to Cabinet by 30 June which will look at how we roll it out to other categories. But we're very aware that this is something that's that's quite new uh, and th we are the first really in the country to do something that's this comprehensive. West Australia have a scheme but it isn't quite as comprehensive as this one. So the idea is to do it in a phased way 
to, to take a very responsible approach uh, and to tweak the scheme as we go so that we're, we're doing this and achieving exactly what we set out to do. Importantly, um, the mandate doesn't impose an extra burden on ethical suppliers. Uh, so the administrative burden really is internal to government. Uh, the, the, it's important that we are clear that this is about people who are, are repeatedly and willfully breaching arrangements. It's not about mistakes. It's not about oversights. This is really about uh, applying to those people who repeatedly and willfully breach conditions. Uh, and people will say, and our minister will say, he was regularly getting feedback from suppliers who would say, look, we know you're contracting with X supplier. We know that they're not meeting their local benefits test. We know that they're saying that they're employing apprenticeships and apprentices and trainees and they're not meeting those commitments and yet you're still continuing to contract with them. And they might burn one department and then they'll move on to another department. So how does how is government going to respond to that? And I guess that part partly through this ethical supplier mandate uh, and, and the threshold is how we are seeking to ensure that we really do only contract with ethical suppliers. And noting that the majority of our suppliers are ethical. This will not apply retrospectively, so it's really important to be clear that um, this is uh, about applying from contracts that began um, after the 1st of August in the building and construction and maintenance category. So yet yeah, contracts that commenced after 1 August. Uh, it's not retrospective. And similarly, in the transport and infrastructure category, it will be contracts that, that commence after 1 October. Uh, so, yeah, importantly, not retrospective. Uh, demerits will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you will see on the screen there that, that we have a scale of points. Uh, two for a minor breach, five for a moderate breach, ten for a major breach. And when people reach 20, over a period of 12 months, similar to a driver's licence sort of scheme, there is the, a sanction. And that sanction is being suspended for 12 months from supplying to the Queensland Government. Demerits will expire a year from the date that they're issued uh, and sanctions will apply where businesses, as I said, are repeatedly behaving in an unethical manner. Uh, Partly of that suspension, uh, if a contract has an option to an ex extend and a, a sanction has been um, put in place, then that option to extend will, will not be actioned. And uh, there are a number of points where there is procedural fairness in, in this. So one of the pieces of feedback that we had when we were talking with uh, suppliers and with government agencies when we went out to talk about this was it's really important to have procedural fairness. And we'll work you through that a little uh, as, as the presentation goes. But effectively, when, when an allegation is made, there is an opportunity for someone to respond to that allegation. But before an allegation is made, it will be up to an agency to talk, th to, to determine whether what that behaviour actually constitutes an allegation. If an, it is an allegation uh, that, that, that you, know, you, you would entertain, uh, then there will be an opportunity to respond to that. And similarly, if there is a, a sanction, if there are um, demerit points issued, there is a an opportunity to respond to that. If a sanction is issued, there's an opportunity to respond there. Uh, and there is then an opportunity to appeal. So number of points where there is procedural fairness. And the appeals process it will be available to all suppliers. So you may well have seen this already. These are the categories um, of compliance that are in the, in the mandate. That's quite a detailed slide. That's part of the mandate and, and is available up on the web. Uh, you'll see that um, as you go through. But you'll see that it's a, a variety of categories that fall under the mandate. Uh, none of these are particularly um, complex, I, I would say. Largely, the mandate is about people complying with the law, complying with their contractual obligations, and complying with the policies in place across that. For example, the Indigenous procurement policy. If people, as part of the negotiations, have signed up to, to, and have 
been assessed uh, as, as being meeting the Indigenous procurement policy, it's important that they do it. So a lot of the ethical supplier mandate is really about um, abiding by the law. It, it, it's not a complex thing. Uh, and that is part of contractual obligations anyhow. What we're really talking about now is just putting some, some I guess, sanctions in place when we see that that's not happening. So the ethical supplier threshold. So people may not have had a lot to do with the ethical supplier threshold. This uh, arose out of the um, wages inquiry, the wage theft inquiry that Parliament conducted last year. Uh, and it's really about saying, we want to do business with people who pay their people appropriately. It, um, it, at different to the mandate, it is actually a condition of supply. So as the name indicates, it's a threshold. It's a do not pass go, do not you know, collect $200. It's, it's one of those uh, mandatory conditions for entering into supply with the Queensland Government. And we will uh, have that, that uh, contract uh, clause as we go forward about people uh, basically uh, saying that they, 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 they do this up front. Again, it applies to all supplies to the Queensland Government. It's different from the mandate in that it isn't a staged rollout. Uh, it applies from, contra from contracts that start from 1 August for all categories, and it applies to all uh, government uh, bodies that are uh, under the Queensland procurement policy. That, so that includes um, government-owned corporations, statutory bodies, etc. A breach of the ethical supplier threshold results in the application of 20 demerits. So again, it's that threshold condition. It, it is a me an immediate sanction. So there's quite, a, as you can imagine, uh, for this sort of thing, there's quite a legalistic definition of what does uh, a pay paying people appropriately mean. Uh, and you can work it through. Largely, it's already, it's about what is covered in legislation. So largely it's about meeting your requirements under legislation, making sure you're meeting all of the entitlements. The one thing that isn't covered in legislation, and it's that last point, which talks about paying people at a level that is a, close to the appropriate award, uh, a level above or, or at the, the current applicable modern award. And that is to capture, there are a number of agreements that were actioned between 2006 and 2009. Um, I think colloquially they're referred to as zombie agreements uh, that uh, uh, if people, uh, people can still have those agreements in place, but it's appropriate that they are paying people at an applicable modern award, which would be above what is outlined in those agreements. So there we go. So why is it needed? Well, a whole range of, um, as a, a regard to feedback that we'd been receiving from, receiving from suppliers, oftentimes about the application of local benefits. We got a lot of feedback saying that there are a number of suppliers who say they're going to provide local benefits but aren't. Uh, but also out of the wage theft inquiry, these sorts of statistics were coming up. And I think, uh, as I said, what it indicates is that while the majority of suppliers are ethical and do the right thing and want to pay their people appropriately, not everyone is. And there is a small percentage of, of suppliers who are engaging in behaviour which is of high risk to the Queensland Government. Uh, and hence, we don't want to do business with those people. So where are we up to? As I mentioned before, with the ethical supplier threshold, it came in from the 1st of August and applies to all categories of spend and to all uh, government agencies and bodies that are subject to the Queensland procurement policy. Uh, in regard to the ethical supplier mandate, it commenced on contracts that commence after 1 August for the building and construction and maintenance category from 1 August, and it will apply to the transport and infrastructure category spend from 1 October. As we go, we're collecting information about, about the rollout uh, and I guess learning as we go and making sure that we tweak the scheme appropriately so that we're implementing it in an appropriate way. 
Uh, certainly, we've done a lot of work with people in the building construction maintenance category to make sure that we have got good contract clauses in place and that we're understanding their business. We have set up a number of working groups with industry to clarify particular points because, as you can appreciate, in the drafting of, of some of these words in the mandate, uh, they again tend to get a little legalistic and sometimes then there can be some confusion around about how it actually applies in real life. So we've had a number of working groups to sit down with industry and work that through. Uh, and I think they have been robust discussions, I would say, very robust discussions, but ultimately incredibly constructive uh, and that we have uh, are developing very good guidance as we go on this and we'll continue to do this. So as I said, we'll review uh, as we're implementing with the building construction and maintenance category and then again continue to review as we roll out with the transport and infrastructure um, category. All of that feedback will then uh, go into a larger review early next year to make sure that we're able to meet our commitment to have the review considered by Cabinet by 30 June. That will then help us shape how implementation rolls out to other categories and what it will mean for government-owned corporations and statutory bodies. So quite a measured approach there. I mean, we know that this is something new and we want to get it right. So who will be responsible for determining compliance? Uh, with the ethical supplier mandate and the ethical supplier threshold, it really is, um, it starts with the procuring agencies. Uh, that is where, uh, appropriately, because you have co the contracts, it is only appropriate that that begin there. In terms of who will make uh, demerit and sanction decisions, that will be through a, pe a procurement penalty and sanctions committee. That uh, committee comprises of Deputy Director General, De Deputies Director General, Directors General? I have to get my, my, my plurals correct. Uh, from across the seven highest spend agencies, and it will also have uh, someone from the Office of Industrial Relations and from the Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships on that. Uh, and the Chief Advisor Procurement, which is me at this current point in time, will chair that committee. So I think we're very aware that this is a serious thing to issue demerit points and then of course to issue a sanction is a very serious thing. We need to have procedural fairness as I've outlined. Uh, but we need to have this considered appropriately at the right level. Uh, we've had a lot of, as you can imagine, we've had um, representations from industry and from industrial advocates about being on that committee and our advice is at this stage it is better that it is an internal to government committee uh, and certainly that is, that is how it will be at this point in time and, and I think moving forward. Uh, and we have in the development of all of this been keeping Crown Law very busy, as you would imagine, and I imagine as we begin to get the committee up and rolling and it's starting to consider demerits and ultimately sanctions, we'll consider continue to, to seek um, strong and clear legal advice on all of this. So as you see, there's also you know, in terms of how it will be detected, there's a number of ways, uh, whether it is through the contract management process, whether it is through a third party complaint or findings from audits. The Queensland Procurement Policy Compliance Unit also audits in regard to best practice principles, the training policy, uh, and now food and beverage audits. I think that we're, we're off to do everything. Uh, so that, if, that may be another source of um, complaint. So who, this comes up for people um, a lot. Uh, who will be notified? So under the mandate and threshold, government buyers, um, as I said, will be responsible for using an online checking tool. And that's a screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, it is um, important to note that when you enter something into that, uh, uh, that, that tool, what you will get is, is th possibly three responses. One, because you'll be entering the ABN, um, is the ABN not known. Uh, two, uh, no issues. Or three, please contact the Queensland um, com uh, Procurement Compliance Unit. Uh, so we're very mindful of the need to keep this sort of information confidential uh, and, and to have it appropriately used. 
So demerits um, and sanctions won't be publicly uh, advertised, they won't be publicly pu published. So the idea would be if there is a question that you would talk to the compliance unit and find out about that. Uh, and it may well be that there is a sanction in place or it may well be that there is just a consideration going through and we would need to let you know about that. Uh, but certainly we're very mindful of uh, acting fairly and justly. Uh, and it may well be that for in a number of uh, categories of spend that what a sanction means is that people are removed from the, the pre-qualification panel. Uh, so it will be something like that as opposed to, you know, it, names being published on a website or anything like that. We don't, you know, we've taken legal, we didn't think it was appropriate, but we've also taken legal advice that that would uh, bring about a whole range of other, other problems. So what does it mean for government buyers? Uh, and it really is about um, using the online checking tool to ensure that suppliers have not been excluded, have not been removed, uh, investigating non-compliance with mandate policy requirements, investigating breaches of the threshold, refer and referring substantial non-compliance issues to the, the penalties, uh, the procurement penalties and sanctions committee. Uh, it may mean, as I said previously, not exercising um, extension options if someone has been san sanctioned under the mandate. Uh, and it, uh, importantly, up front, it means that we'll be including clauses about uh, compliance um, in, with the threshold and the mandate in contracts up front and in tender documents up front. So all of that is clear at, at the beginning. That's the presentation, and as I said, you've possibly heard that information before. Uh, the important thing of, of us being here today is to being able to work through any questions that people have, whether um, coming in uh, from our live streaming or from the audience. So I might now hand over, um, and we have the lovely Kelly, I think, has a, has a microphone. So very open to having questions. Anyone in the room? The questions. Do you mind if I kick us off? So online we have a number of people watching obviously and we do have an online question of why does the register only have ABN, ACNs as opposed to ABNs? I'll let you, I think I said ABNs, I'm sorry that's my mistake. <laughs> um, uh, no, no worries Sharon. The, um, uh, the register does ask you for an ACN, the, the, the reason for that uh, is that um, uh, relates to privacy law. So privacy law applies to um, individuals but not to companies. Um, so in the case of individual suppliers, so that would be sole traders or partnerships that are unincorporated, uh, you will need to um, uh, rely on mechanisms other than the online register. So you will either need to ensure that those people are on one of those um, uh, standing offer arrangements that um, we will be where we'll be advising the arrangement owner uh, to remove people who are sanctioned. So if you're going to those arrangements, uh, you can do that with comfort. Uh, or alternatively, if, if uh, uh, you're otherwise dealing with a sole trader and you need to go through this checking process, uh, then you need to contact the compliance unit. Uh, through, in fact, the email address which is on the screen at the moment, uh, and, and we will provide you with a quick response to, to, the, to the sanction status. Terrific. So. Thanks, Peter. <coughs> Perfect. My apologies. Thank you. <laughs> um, what happens if you've got a supplier that um, has a sanction against them, but you've got a long-running contract with them. How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so, so in terms of the mandate, the sanctions are all prospective. They're all in the future, so it doesn't have a bearing on contracts on foot. So, so that's probably the simplest part to your question. That, that's not to say, obviously, um, <coughs> Obviously that that situation has arisen because that supplier is in breach of that contract. So uh, 
this is not meant to replace that contractual management, management process. So you would need to make an assessment of what that contract breach means for that contract. So if it was uh, as, a fundamental as, breach, yeah. you might want to take action under the contract. Mm. No, no. no. Um, in, in terms of the threshold, it's slightly different in the sense that uh, a breach of the threshold will give rise to a fundamental breach of the contract. Uh, and um, I, I think it would be wrong for me to say anything but government's expectation is that we would um, um, you know, take action to, to immediately stop doing business with that supplier. So. Yeah. Good morning. Um, we, I work for the Housing Partnerships Office mm -hmm. of Department of Housing and Public Works. We are actually in the process of having multiple contracts signed with the EST requirements and mm -hmm. supply mandate um, requirements. Once the EST form or declaration is completed, um, how do we go about getting that information registered? Do we go in and register that ourselves or what's the process? Mm -hmm. And do we need to keep a register ourselves or keep referring back to that one? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. We, there's, there's no, um, uh, short of a breach, there's no requirement in policy for you to let us know. Now, yeah. having, having said that, um, we'd probably be grateful for that information because that does assist us in terms of, not, not this process, but in terms of our business intelligence work to know what's out there. So, so I'm guessing you're meaning if a supplier comes back and says, no, I don't meet. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think that will be unlikely, but possible. Uh, the reason I think it's unlikely is that they'll essentially be writing back to say, yes, I am breaking the law. Um, and most people wouldn't do that. Uh, the, the most people would choose to not proceed with the, with the process. But if you do, if you are aware of that business intelligence, we welcome you letting us know, but there's no requirement for you to report that. Where there's a breach, so where you've got a contract on foot and you become aware that the supplier is in breach of the threshold or, or a mandate provision, uh, then yes, then you do need to, to let us know. And there's guidance online to talk to you about how to do that. Mm, sure. That list therefore, the supplier list, would only really capture those that are going through a process at the moment to investigate an allegation, or those um, companies that potentially already have demerit points or sanctions placed on them. So, so the online lookup tool will only provide you with information about sanctioned okay. providers. Okay. Um, um, quite specifically. Um, we're not publishing demerits and we uh, are not, not keen to see demerits used as a proxy for uh, assessment. contract yeah. assessment, uh, tender assessment. So, so, yeah. So we should be using that as a reference tool before we contract with any contractors? Uh, um, yeah, unless, unless they're in a pre-qualification scheme or So the pre-qualification scheme for builders if they are already registered through that process, there's no requirement to do the EST or ESM. Is that what you're uh, asking? There's no requirement to use the lookup tool to okay. confirm that they're sanctioned. But they're still required to fill out the EST form? Uh, absolutely. And we include uh, the special condition in the contract? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and right. do we, like, if we're contracting with one construction firm for 10 various contracts throughout the year, they complete one form for every one EST form for every contract? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so not solely one for a group of five that might go through at once? Um, so, 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 so the EST if, if you're contracting form over the course of a year, obviously yep. situation could change, change yeah. through yep. the year, so, so you will So it's not valid for a period of time as such? No, no, because no, it's no. talking about, it's a, it's a declaration of okay. current right. and past. Yeah. So we would just compliance. be required to keep that um, in our trim system. I think that's the... Yeah. Yep. 
okay. Oh, and right. there's no need for us to keep a register in house of ones that have been completed over the time or anything like that? There's, there's, there's no policy requirement. Oh. I think that's a valid question for you to ask in terms of your own contract management systems as okay. to whether that's that's useful. useful. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, if you don't mind me asking, can I just uh, check, does the mandate and threshold apply to all Queensland businesses and companies? Or is it only for particular contracts? So just across the board, generically, do these policy requirements apply to, to any business? So the, the threshold applies to uh, businesses doing business with the Queensland Government. So that, that, that you mean if, you, if you're not doing business with the Queensland Government, we hope you apply the law and, and abide by the law. But with the ethical supplier threshold, and you are, if you are doing business with the Queensland Government, uh, you, you must meet that threshold regardless of the category of spend that you're doing business on or whether you're contracting with a, a budget agency or a government-owned corporation or a statutory body. So it applies across the board. With the supplier mandate, uh, it currently applies to businesses who are supplying for business construction and maintenance if they have a contract that commences after 1 August. Uh, from 1 October, uh, it will apply to businesses who are contracting with the Queensland Government in the transport and infrastructure spend category uh, and have contracts that commence after 1 October. So yes, and then following the, the review next year, we'll make a uh, determination about how it's rolled out to cate other categories of spend, so general goods and services, uh, medical, etc., cetera, uh, and the application to the government-owned corporations and statutory bodies. So yeah, different between the threshold and the mandate. Perfect, Sharon, thank you for that clarification. Can I please also ask in terms of the investigation of an allegation of a breach, who will carry this out? Mm -hmm. I'll let you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so as is the case already, because we're talking essentially about contractual breach, um, that's the responsibility of the contract manager for, for the uh, for the particular contract and therefore for the procuring agency. So it's, um, uh, I, I will make the comment in terms of investigation that our investigation guidelines um, uh, talk about uh, proportionality. So, so that's to say not every breach will require um, a very large complex investigation. Some breaches will be extremely simple uh, and, and boil down to some basic facts that would come through in the contract management process. So, so uh, I would um, ask you not to get distracted by the word investigation. Um, uh, it, it, it may well be an investigation if it's complex. It may well be um, a simple matter of resolving that in the normal process that you would undertake uh, to resolve a contractual breach. I say it's always a contractual breach because um, uh, it, those aspects of the mandate which are uh, related to breaches of law, um, because they're breaches of law and because of the construct of our contracts, they are effectively breaches of contract as well. So, so um, they would be managed in the usual way. And obviously if there's a, an appropriate regulator uh, managing those breaches of law, um, then it may well be appropriate to see to refer the matter to the regulator for them to undertake the investigation. Again, always depending on mm. the complexity and the, and the yeah proportionality. Mm. I think is the key word there. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we've been out talking with industry, mm. I mean, oftentimes their first uh, thing is, oh, okay, so if I get a workplace health and safety notice, is that is that a breach? You know, is that is that mm. and well, actually, it's everything's on a case by case basis. But it is, does come down to that. We're not here to play gotcha with people. Uh, this is about, as I keep saying, willful and repeated behaviour. It's not about oversights or mistakes or, or accidents. Uh, our, I mean, we want suppliers to succeed. We want people to do well. Uh, we, and as, as all of you would know, we, we like um, to work with our suppliers to make sure they meet the conditions uh, and, and we want people to succeed. So I think that's been the approach on, on most things uh, and that's not going to change here. But there is a small proportion of businesses who are deliberately 
um, engaging in behaviour that, that we don't want to see. And, and that's really who this is aimed at. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I just, just whilst uh, the microphone moves, I'll also say uh, if, if uh, contract managers, procurement agencies have questions about a particular case, um, uh, by all means contact us through the phone number you see on the screen or the email address and we'll provide some advice about how to manage that particular um, uh, case. Companies who have a breach against them, if they say fix their, their issues, okay. um, and obviously that we've, the Queensland Government have moved on, how is that put in, into a, um, the database to say, well, this company has now been, the, the issues have been rectified, so that you're not penalising companies for, for breaches from maybe a few years back? Mm -hmm. Um, so so the, f the first thing to say in terms of um, a few years back is that the sanctions can, will never be more than a 12-month sanction. So they'll so, be wiped? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the, the slate will be wiped clean. Uh, in, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of that sort of rectification question, um, I, I guess to begin with, the expe expectation is that we would aim for rectification, as Sharon's just said. Um, very early, so, so before perhaps there's even a contractual breach um, and, and certainly before the matter's referred. So by the time we get to the Penalties and Sanctions Committee, um, uh, we've obviously got some serious difference of opinion between the supplier and government um, or some serious willful behaviour on the part of the supplier. Uh, obviously a supplier might rectify after that point um, and We'd encourage that too, um, uh, but um, I think by the time you've gotten to that point, you've probably received a sanction uh, that you deserve, and so uh, we, we would work through that uh, circumstance, I think. But I think you're right. That's that notion of, well, how do people, uh, if they've had that, uh, if they've been sanctioned uh, and they've been suspended for a year, uh, how does that not be a continuing blot on you going on forward? Because we know that companies change management, they change practices, and, and things evolve. And I think that is mm. the, the, the kind of notion that you kind of, it's almost a do your time, mm. uh, and then it, it, again, that's wiped clean as well. And so, uh, while it, I mean, it's always difficult if you know that someone's had a sanction in the mm. past, that is there in your mind, but I think we would be clear mm. that we know that, that companies regenerate and move uh, and that, that, that possibly in the tendering or contracting process, they may be keen to show you that they, yeah, that they have rectified mm. previous mm. issues. Mm. Um, so, um, will agencies be required to report annually on the amount of um, checks they undertake or will there be audits on them to actually make sure that they're complying? I don't, I don't think yeah. we... I, I'll, 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 I'm looking at Peter to make sure that he's not keen to build an empire here, <laughs> but um, at this stage, no. I think, I mean, that doing the sort of the checks and, and investigating potential breaches of the mandate and or the contract is kind of agency's business and I, it's something that people do on a regular basis, I would imagine. So I don't think we would be um, keen to capture that or to have you report annually on it. That seems a little bit of a, of a burden. Um, that said, uh, I think sharing business intelligence with us is always really welcome uh, uh, and, and anything we can do to help each other in terms of business intelligence is great. But I mean, that would be my, my first response is I don't think we wanna, wanna do that. Uh, unless it would be helpful, and I'm not seeing how it would be helpful over, over the time. Mm. But mm. Peter? Yeah, I, I, I would I'd just add, uh, certainly, you know, we're not planning audits of agencies. Um, what, 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 I, what I would say, though, is that the Queensland Audit Office has a long-running interest in agency contract management practice, um, and so they may well uh, include this in their assessments. We haven't ask them to do so, but, but that they, you know, that it's, a, it's a valid scope for that. Uh, and I would imagine that internal audit functions would have an interest too in that um, contract management process. But no, not, not centrally are we talking about, um, about that. 
Yeah, and um, just with contracts, yeah. um, is it just formal contracts or so there's lots out there that might go out to three suppliers for something that might cost $1,500 and an email might form a contract of such. Mm -hmm. An email back just accepting their quote. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, um, uh, so the, in both cases, it's applicable to all contracting that's within the category. And so, for for the threshold, all contracts, all categories, all buyers. So, so um, strictly speaking, yes, it does apply to those um, those types of arrangements. The um, um, uh, but certainly in terms of getting the three quotes, we hope that the online tool provides a very simple mechanism to, to clear somebody in terms of going through with that. Uh, another question which has been asked of us and which we're currently working through with an interdepartmental working group uh, is the question of corporate card transactions. So again, strictly, uh, government does not uh, want to be doing business with uh, businesses engaged in wage theft and that includes through corporate card transactions. Um, um, there are some lo logistical questions yes. about how we work our way through that uh, and um, so we're working with agencies to come up with some guidance about how to manage the risk of that, um, of that contracting. Thanks. All right, we um, do We've There's a, a question here. Apologies. Um, so just to let you know, we do have a handful of questions coming through online as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, just another question. With the construction contracts, our process that we've adopted is that we send out the um, threshold form first. Mm -hmm. Once that's received and obviously ticks all the boxes, we then um, progress the, the construction contract mm -hmm. with that special condition mm -hmm. um, for signing. Is that the correct process there? So it's like a two-fold process? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. Just a question that's come through online about the relationship with SOAs. So if there is an issue with a supplier on a current SOA and therefore they're removed, is there a time frame on the breach before they're reinstated? And you may have covered this off, but just in, in terms of the SOA process. So uh, generally it's a 12 month um, sort of suspension. So it would be a 12 month suspension from the, from, from the SOA uh, and then, then wiped clean and so with the opportunity to be able to be brought back. Perfect, thank you for that clarification. Does this apply to commercial business units with agencies? Absolutely. Um, as buyers. As buyers, yes, yes. So yeah. as buyers or are they thinking about the other way around as suppliers? Um, just, the, yep. it was a general question, yep. my apologies. No, no. So yeah, as, as buyers it absolutely applies, mm -hmm. but also as... Not, not as a supplier. As a supplier, yep. but it, it, it would depend on, mm. yes. Yeah, yep. so, so, so um, um, to, to pick two very specific examples, building and asset services in HPW, in Housing and Public Works, uh, and uh, Road Tech in yep. um, Department of Transport and Main Roads. Um, they're not subject to demeriting or sanctions, um, but they are subject to um, the requirement, like all other government buyers, that when they source, um, they're using the mandate and applying the threshold. But, but no, that, they, they won't be subject to demerits themselves. Perfect, thank you. And I might just do one more from online, sorry if you don't mind. Um, so just a quick question in regards to contracts that were awarded prior to the commencement of the mandate or the threshold, but then a variation is required post the 1st of August. How are you requiring agencies to manage the EST and does it still apply? Yeah. Do you want the variation? <laughs> um, um, so, um, uh, the short answer to that is yes, if you're doing a variation, uh, there is an expectation that we would look to include the threshold in that variation process. Um, in relation to sanctions and demerits, at what level do they apply? Do they apply at a company level or perhaps a subsidiary service provider? Mm -hmm. Through the contractor. Mm -hmm. contractor. So, so um, um, uh, there's, there's a few ways to... Um, there's a few answers to your question. Um, 
Uh, certainly a, a head contractor or a managing contractor could be responsible for the breaches of uh, its subcontractors, uh, as is the case in contract. So, so um, um, uh, as it is the case in contract, so it is possible that they, both parties in that relationship, uh, could have demerits imposed for the same breach. Um, the, but the, not always. But not always. The, the key question in terms of the head or managing contractor will be whether they took reasonable action to prevent the breach taking place. And as Sharon's indicated, um, if the breach has occurred and on the managing contractor's part there isn't willful behaviour, um, and willful, by the way, includes grossly ne negligent behaviour, um, if, if that hasn't taken place, then there's no liability there. The Penalties and Sanctions Committee also has um, a capacity to, um, uh, to impose demerits and or sanctions on parents and subsidiary companies, uh, as well as some related entities, particularly Phoenix entities, where one company's shut down and another one's raised up to, to avoid this, this sort of thing. So, so that will be a, that'll be its own process, so the Penalties and Sanctions Committee will need to be advised of that and make a decision, and there'll be natural justice around that as well, but, but that's how that's to be managed. Uh, Kelly? Does that cover it? <laughs> yeah. Just a particular scenario, if a procuring agency was to receive a phone call from a subcontractor making an allegation against a principal contractor, what would you expect the procuring agency to do in that situation? I'll let you to To treat that complaint uh, uh, with appropriate weight, I guess. The, the, um, uh, Again, the question, the answer is really the same as is the current case in terms of contractual breach. So, so if the subcontractor were alleging a contractual breach on the part of the managing contractor, um, of course we have uh, a legal and moral duty to uh, work out what's going on. Um, we we have um, we have had the question asked about um, uh, vexatious or unsubstantiated claims, and of course that's. That's part of that assessment yeah. process as, as per normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, essentially, if a subcontractor complains, um, then um, the, the information they've provi provided needs to be um, considered and, and action taken. So. Um, whose responsibility is it to notify the supplier of the breach? Hmm. So, so the. Con yeah. Uh, the contract manager, uh, as it is as it is the case now, in terms of any con contractual breach. But are you talking about if a demerit, if actual demerit points are ah. no, so the mm. so mm. if we move into that, then uh, effectively that will be considered by the pen penalties and sanctions committee, and they will issue the breach, mm -hmm. the, the demerit points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, the invitation documents require the supplier to tell procuring agencies if they have breached in the last five years. So why is it the case uh, if it resets after, t why is that the particular case if it resets after 12 months? So that's largely because we're looking prospectively. So this, um, that, that clause will make more sense in five years time. Uh, so, it, it, we're, we're, uh, so effectively you're looking at behavior that's uh, five years in the past but because we're only looking at contracts that start from the 1st of August, uh, that is really kind mm. of redundant, mm. I guess, at this point in time. But the idea is that these provisions will be ongoing uh, and, and it is to uh, assess about behaviour for five years back. So it's really that just where we're at the beginning of the implementation, why that looks a little strange mm. and is not uh, appropriate, mm. I guess. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I know that you spoke about the agency's responsibility to investigate allegations of breach, but just in responding to a said allegation, where does the onus of proof lie and what is the applicable standard? Is it a balance of probabilities or beyond reasonable doubt situation? Mm -hmm. um, so so um, 
Uh, in terms of contractual breaches, it's very definitely a balance of probabilities test. Um, so what was the first part of the question? That was before the, oh, the onus of proof. Yes. Um, um, uh, so that's an interesting question. The, the, um, uh, the onus of proof would be on the, on the supplier uh, once the allegation's been made and put to them. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, it is a balance of probabilities test. So it's, a, it's um, uh, whether the breach is more likely than not to have occurred. So in terms of a regulatory breach, so I did mention before that um, uh, if, if, if um, uh, basically if there's a sort of prima facie case that there's a breach of regulation and it's referred to the regulator, um, there are many regulators with many different uh, 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 onus arrangements and standards of proof, but it's usually a stricter test in those sort of circumstances. But the, the procuring agency needn't worry about that so much. That's the regulator's uh, responsibility. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we we have some procuring agencies who currently have um, extensions to carry out for SOAs. So under that scenario, do they need to address the EST prior to or during this extension process? Mm. Uh, um, yeah. Effectively, yes. yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Does anyone else in the room? Perfect. Hi. In a Department of Transport and Main Roads, we run a pre-qualification system closely with NPS. Mm -hmm. So if we have a case of applying these demerits points and suspension of a company within Queensland, how we uh, deal with it? Was there any discussion about it? Mm. Indeed. Mm. And we've yeah. been having a lot of discussions with TMR about just this, this issue. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and they continue, I think, is yeah. the fair thing to say. So, so prior to the 1st of October, uh, there'll be guidance about how this scheme and the, um, the National Pre-Qualification Scheme Inter operate. Inter intersect. Intersect, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yes. Only to Queensland, yes. It doesn't apply in other states. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it's really only in Queensland. Thank you for that. Um, just in relation to the information provided um, regarding road tech specifically previously, mm -hmm. there's just a question that's come through in terms of the engagement with road tech. Do procuring agencies need to get road tech to respond to the ethical supplier threshold and mandate when they create contracts with them? For example, responding to the EST on the invitation to tender documents, oh. um, or are they exempt from this requirement? Yeah, they're, yeah. they're exempt from that requirement. That was um, an easy answer, thank you. <laughs> Just um, another one that's come through in regards to the onus of proof. Is placing the onus of proof in the supplier not a reversal of the presumption of innocence? <laughs> talking contract law and contract yeah. management. Um, yeah. So, I mean, effectively there is usually a show cause process in place um, mm. in, in regard to contracts and so, it becomes um, with. I'm not a lawyer. I'll be very clear mm. about that. Mm. But uh, but when there is an a, a allegation of a, of a breach of contract, uh, there's usually a show cause process, uh, and that requires a response. Uh, and so, uh, whether we're calling onus of proof a response, we ask people to respond mm. when we when when we have those complaints. Um, and and. Uh, whether we're satisfied with the response or not, taking into account other other circumstances, allows a decision. Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Were there any other questions in the room at this point? No, excellent. I believe that we may have addressed all of the questions that have come through online. So thank you very much for, for tackling some of those discussion points and creating clarity around some of these niche questions. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks, um, thanks everyone. That's a really good discussion, and uh, mm. it's terrific as we work through these kind of sessions. People raise really good uh, points, and that's just adding to our guidance material. So it's been really valuable. Really appreciate you attending. Um, but of course, if other questions come to mind after the session, uh, certainly to people online and people in the room, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, sometimes we have to give some thought and consideration to them and get back to you, but um, it's just really valuable. It's, it's just helping as we go through. So thanks everyone. Thank you.